Welcome to a brief video that includes material from six interviews with Sisters of Mercy concerning their lives as Catholic religious women. The women in this video are Sister Yvette Diaz, who has worked as a social worker, a clinical therapist, a program director of various sorts, a pastoral associate, and as a coordinator for medical teams on international service trips. Currently, she ministers as a vocation director, sharing her joy as a Sister of Mercy with those who are interested in religious life. Sister Ruth Neely serves as a nurse practitioner with AIDS patients in Northwestern Pennsylvania. She is, was also appointed to the Pennsylvania Governor's Health Policy Board. Sister Teresa Kane currently serves as a college professor in women's studies. In 1979, when Sister Teresa was serving as president of the U.S. Leadership Conference of Women Religious, she asked Pope John Paul II about the possibility of women being included in all ministries of the church. She has continued to speak, teach, and advocate for the expansion of women's roles in the church and in society. Sister Diane Zabrowski, she has served as a teacher, a principal, and a former president of the Sisters of Mercy in New Jersey. Currently, she works in donor relations for Georgian Court University, a Mercy-sponsored university in New Jersey. Sister Karen Snyder is a pediatrician at John Hopkins University Hospital, and she travels to many developing countries where she leads medical mission teams and performs surgeries for children in need. Sister Rose Martin, she has a PhD in education and serves as Executive Director of Hope Partnership for Education, a middle school in the poorest neighborhood of Philadelphia. Well, I mean, I think that we're, we are women um, wanting to live out of the gospel, the values of the gospel. You know, um, our lives are centered in God. And so Catherine McCauley, who was our founder, always would say, you know, our lives are centered in God, who we, who we go forward and backwards, like always knowing that God is the center of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that um, foremost, we are women of prayer and then, and then women of service. And so our service comes out of our prayer life and our desire to serve God's people. Every day you're touching lives and you're, you're living out this theology of mercy continually. You see, you feel, you act, you sustain. You see something, you feel, you act, and you sustain. And what I like most about it is the direct service where I can actually be with that person and touch that person and responding to that need immediately. It was a call to do something that would be bigger than myself. Now that's the best way I can have of explaining it, but it was a really a spiritual awakening in a very young child that I wanted to do something with my life that was worthwhile, that was important, that would have meaning, meaning to it, and also that was very connected to God. For some reason, I, I call it a spiritual call that I had. My passion is for people, relationships. I long to empower people to live life-centered lives which are sharing, caring, and finding their passion in life. And I think there is that sense of being a celibate woman in the midst of other celibate women have definitely freed me to be able to say, yes, I can go here, I can go there, I can go to Africa, I can go to Sudan, I can go to Haiti, I can, I can go at the drop of a hat, you know, it, it's, I, I'm much freer in that sense. I believe the, the work that I'm doing now um, is, I suppose, the fulfillment of a dream because I'm working with the poorest population of children possible and that's what I've always wanted to do and uh, I have the privilege of um, co-founding a ministry, um, Sisters of Mercy and the Society of the Holy Child Jesus, 
who founded Hope Partnership for Education, and it's a middle school and adult education center in North Philadelphia, in the poorest zip code in the city. And so um, we're right in the place that we need to be. And this ministry allows me to use every single thing I learned uh, when I studied. And uh, we've been at it now for 13 years and have seen a great deal of growth and so many people involved. It's, it's really wonderful. For me, the, I think the greatest blessing has been um, meeting some very remarkable women that I would say are wisdom figures in my life, sisters, plus traveling to parts of the world that are very poor, Peru, Guatemala, um, living in Belize, with, and um, being really touched by um, people. The blessing has been in how much I've received from the people I've served. Mm -hmm. That they, they, in the midst of so much suffering, um, can still experience joy and um, such deep faith um, that it's not about the material. It's more about, for them, it was more about making sure that they just had what they needed. And, mm -hmm. and um, they taught me a lot. You have your spring friends, your summer friends, your autumn friends, and your winter friends. And most of the time with the patients that I care, we care for, we're their summer friend, encouraging them, wanting them to take care of themselves, wanting them to feel good about themselves, have meaning in their life. That, that means so, so much. So, and, and the other part of theology of friendship is um, to watch myself grow as a sister of mercy with how God has been my friend. And when you're young in your 20s and 30s, you, it, you don't grasp it so much. But the older you get, the human experience, you touch your people, you, you touch your God, and you become deeper. And the Sisters of Mercy have just nurtured that in me so, so well. I would say what has happened to me in my spirituality through the years has probably been a combination of liberation theology and now in very recent years, feminist spirituality where my images and my understandings of God have changed very dramatically. Mm -hmm. So I don't use sexist language. I use God, if I talk about God as father, I always say God as mother as well as father. I don't use terms such as king and judge and lord, that God has become my companion, my advocate, my comforter, my friend. Mm -hmm. And I feel that um, I feel that I pray always. I think for Catholics, it helped us to have a development of conscience, which is very important to spirituality and to spirit. Uh, at one time, we would be much more compliant and passive, and therefore, whatever the rules, there was a saying, if you keep the rules, the rules will keep you. <laughs> now, I think we changed dramatically from that because we believe that the rules are to be of service to us, but if they're no longer of service, they need to be changed. If our own conscience and our own development of spirituality brings us in another direction, we need to follow that. Vatican Council II was absolutely essential for the 20th and for the 21st century yeah. because it just turned the church completely around. My hopes for all of us, all religious communities, is that we be truly the women that we are called to be, inspired by God, by our founders and foundresses. For me, it's Catherine McCauley, who is an inspiration in everything I do. And to be with lay men and women, students, also to be with persons who have a belief in God, but have different expressions of their faith. and. Uh, that whole dimension is exciting to me, and I am happy that I'm part of the change. I love change. You know, I didn't join the sisters to be by myself, to be alone, mm -hmm. to yeah. not have a friend. I joined because community was important to me, and being with other people was important. So I think it was that whole, the mercy charism, mm -hmm. the serving, the fact that they take a fourth vow to serve the poor, sick, and ignorant, um, I loved that. I mean, it was, I heard it and it was like, oh my God, yes. You know, that's me. That's what I want to do. 
Um, so right now the countries that I visit are Kenya, Nigeria, Haiti, and Guyana. I have a crazy surgeon who will travel with me. Um, she's semi-retired. She is a crackerjack. And we can go off into these rural areas and do, she predominantly does hernia surgeries for little boys. And these are kids who would walk around and have a hernia their whole lives. And they come to us when they're 10 years of age, or six, or four, or three. Um, and we can repair them the way that we do it in a rural setting. Um, our, our best was in Haiti, we did 82 surgeries in a rural area. That's 82 little kids' lives were changed. I think there's a freedom that women religious have to um, advocate, to speak the truth, um, and also uh, part of our role is what Catherine talked about in connecting the rich to the poor, the healthy to the sick, the educated to the uninstructed. And, and I have the privilege of that, doing that every day because I work in a ministry where we need other people's help. I think we're going to have an important role to play because I think the world is craving for spirituality. Mm -hmm. And as the world continues to crave for that desire of spirituality and that in spiritual, that we, ha we have a model to show them that you can be a celibate woman religious yeah. and be able to um, contribute something to the to the world, and, I, and it's countercultural. It's uh, you know that you desire to live simple with other women, and that of in service, and that, um, but that the most important piece of our lives is always that centeredness in God, that desire to to grow closer to God. And I think the world craves that. And so, you know, people will say, "Oh yes, you can do that as a single person. You could do that." But I, when you do it as a group, as a witness to in a group, I think that that speaks more. My greatest awareness and even thinking about this is God's providence through my life. I cannot imagine a better life. And uh, every day I know God's reality in my life in a million ways. I make it a practice to write down five things I'm grateful for every night, but I could write all night long. And so I think that's a wonderful, uh, hopefully last word. <laughs>